Well, thank you. My name is Ignasi, and thanks for the invitation, as always. Um, uh, last year, I explained you more or less what I did with my project in Facebook, and I update you my achievements, let's say, during 2017. And this year, I will explain what I did, what I did in this uh, 2018. And hopefully, it will interest you and you can apply it on your think tanks and organizations. So the title of this talk is What Can We Learn From This Project, Spanish Libertarian? Uh, more or less, let me show you what I have achieved during this last year. Um, on March 2018, I had 10,000 followers and today I have almost uh, 25,000. Thousand subscribers, and I will explain you how I did it. Yeah, here you can see the numbers. Okay, I will divide this talk in four main topics. The first one is uh, reasons for optimism. Then I will talk briefly about the cultural battle. Then I will explain you precisely what I did. These seventy-five interviews that I did on my YouTube channel, and then I will talk about something that I call the big picture. Because in this talk, I want to explain you what I did, but I always like to reflect on things, and I think it's important, and hopefully we can do it together. Okay, first of all, reasons for optimism. Um, I think that something is changing in the Latin American Spanish audience, and I think there's four main reasons for that. Uh, first of all, and I think this is in Spain, but I don't know if you can apply it on other countries, actually. There's no reasonable, reasonable debate on mass media, and we can see it. Everything is noisy, everything is um, uh, clickbait, there's no debate, there's no arguments, everything is full of fallacies, and you cannot make more than 30 seconds of speech. So I think some audience, or most of the audience, are actually aware of that, and there's a new market niche here, and it's on YouTube. Also, the audience is changing or has changed. This is what we call the digital natives, the millennials and the Z generation. Um, you know, they are the generation that they take, uh, they look more at the smartphone rather than TV, and they are all the time connected on on internet and social media. And obviously, the TV cannot provide the content that they want. And again, that's an opportunity for YouTubers. Also, super important, there's a new uh, opportunity of uh, having a proper connection between content creators and the fan base. And again, the mass media can compete with you. Um, we have these four platforms of community, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Twitter, uh, YouTube community. There's a new uh, label that they have uh, invented. Also, they can pay you via Patreon, PayPal, or even using cryptocurrencies. You can have a direct interaction using uh, Telegram groups or Reddit that is super famous or even a Discord you can have uh, different chats on this platform and of course there's new platforms such as YouTube or Twitch that this is for, for lives he, this says that I have to restart it <laughs> what? no I don't want to restart it Bye. no come on <laughs> what's going on Okay. Yeah, and I mean, even Facebook Live that uh, Gloria was mentioning. Again, this has never been easier and affordable to reach a, a broad audience than today. You just have to buy a... This is actually the equipment that I have. <laughs> a webcam, a mini tripod, microphone, um, this uh, LED lighting, a laptop, and some uh, programs for editing. Uh, this Zoom, this is the program that I use for the interviews. And um, I don't know, with 300 euros or 400 euros, you can have your own TV station, so to speak. And if you think about it, that was unthinkable many years ago. Okay, let's talk about what I call the cultural battle, because um, if we want to communicate ideas, we, I mean, we have to do something more than communicate. We have to think how we do it and um, we have to reflect on the environment. I like this quote from this guy that actually I'm very inspired by him. His name is Dave Rubin and he has this channel called The Rubin Report. He says, most of us are socially liberal and physical, fiscally conservative. Most of us are not the alt-right or the regressive left. 
Most of us don't care what you do in the privacy of your own home, and we want government to take less instead of giving more. I think that's an inclusive quote, so to speak. I mean, uh, conservative classical liberals or libertarians might feel aligned with these kind of quotes. So there's a new environment or uh, a new space that uh, people from different ideologies might work together, and that's part of the cultural battle that uh, I'm talking about. Also, I would like to point out this quote from this uh, Argentinian author called uh, Agustin Laje that I interviewed. <coughs> and uh, I think he identifies himself something like uh, conservative liberals. And I uh, asked him, what do you think about libertarians? And he said, libertarians tend to be stuck in the conflictive logic of the Cold War. But that was already debunked by Mises in his book Socialism on 1922. They need to understand that there's a new battle going on, and that's a cultural battle embedded in the postmodern area that we're living in. This is super important, I think, because I think we are still fighting, so to speak, socialism and trying to dismantle it. And that I think the left doesn't care about workers anymore, and they are fighting new battles in the postmodern area, so to speak. And if we want to dismantle, we have to be aware of that and work. Uh, through a different direction. So I think there's something like uh, what I call a new center of, uh, um, of political discussion and we can build bridges uh, with uh, classical liberals, conservative and libertarians. We might have our differences, but I think we, if we want to, to work together against uh, leftism or, or extreme right-wing ideas, um, we have to join forces and that's what I did in my channel. Instead of only talking about libertarians, um, I interviewed and I give the voice to, to align ideologies. So, what are the hot trending topics of this cultural battle nowadays? Um, I think most of the people are interested in free speech, this uh, gender identity, modern feminism, economic policies and personal liberties. That's what I also try to talk in my channel. And let me just talk briefly about, uh, for example, this concept, the safety net. I wrote an article on it. I think, um, yeah, uh, libertarians uh, should also talk about this safety net, meaning like the free market system or uh, capitalist system. It's also something like a safety net for, for poor people. So we want to show like this empathetic um, voice and sometimes people uh, don't uh, see us as this uh, empathetic voice or, or that we want to take care of poor also. Actually, I did a video about this. But because I think most of the people actually think that the safety net is this. I love this picture. So you see the taxpayers in here, and you see the big government bailouts, Fannie Mae, Too Big to Fail, Freddie Mac, Beer Stearns, uh, banks, etc. So I think that, as an example, that's, this is the image that we need to change because people tend to associate capitalism to this and that's not true. And so we have to fight the cultural battle. Okay, this is the most important part of my talk. <clears throat> this last year I made 75 interviews. I don't know how I did it, <laughs> to be honest, but I did it and here I am explaining to you. Yeah, this is the, these are the numbers I show you. These are some of the interviews I did. I see, well, actually, I interviewed the three of them and some people in the audience, so I can uh, improvise with uh, what I had, but it has worked pretty well. <clears throat> I've been also doing debates, as you can see here, online debates or one-to-one or, um, -one real person debates. Um, I have a lot of fun. People like it. There's a... I don't know, as I told you before, there's, it's, this is a new market opportunity, let's say, for, for different, different discussions and, and people like it. And also I am creating my own content in where I talk about uh, concepts like this, like I'm talking about, or Gramsci, or, or battle of ideas, market of ideas, uh, um, selfishness versus altruism, etc. So more or less how I do it, and if you want to make interviews in your, so in your associations and think tanks, I think this might uh, be useful for you. So um, when I approach a new guest, 
What I do is that I send them a message on Facebook or Twitter, Instagram, WhatsApp, or I contact someone that, that might have their um, contact. Then I organize the schedule for the interview. I send them the questions. Then I send them the link of the Zoom, the platform that I use. Then I op obviously I make the interview. And then I send them the YouTube link plus my social media accounts because I want them to tag me on their publications so I have part of their followers to my fan base. And then also I think that's important. I, might, I maintain my relationship with them and I share some of my new updates. So I try to maintain a friendly relationship and that's, this is also very useful for networking because I think networking is useful if you're doing something productive and if you are just networking for, I don't know, bullshit or just sharing some new fake updates, it doesn't make sense. But um, if I have a new relationship with my new friends, so to speak, they will take me in consideration and at the end this libertarian movement will grow and grow. Also very important, the other part, the relationship with my audience. As, uh, I usually publish a survey on social media, like who do you want me to interview, what do you want me to ask him or her. I publish the interview on YouTube and, and Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, blah, blah, blah. Then I publish a one minute extract, something like a teaser to direct more traffic to the long interview. And then I chat with my audience in this Discord, Telegram uh, platforms that I told you. Um, <clears throat> You know, the idea is, uh, did you like the interview? What was the, the part that you enjoyed the most? So I tried to, to create engagement because I, I published one hour interviews of 45 minutes and I am the first one to be surprised that people tend to like it. <laughs> so my approach, uh, as I told you, I interviewed these uh, liberty-oriented people, let's say this new center that I told you before, libertarians, anarcho-capitalists, classical liberals, conservative, and I also interviewed a couple, not that much, I wish I could do it more, um, reasonable social democrats, people who label themselves as, as socialists, but not uh, crazy socialism, like northern countries of Europe, kind of. And also people liked, the fan base enjoy a lot, um, actually having different people uh, in my interviews, if not everything becomes this echo chamber, that uh, it's pointless. <laughs> um, also, I talk about different topics, not only about uh, politics and economy, that is what we usually talk in the libertarian movement. I, we talk about personal growth and personal responsibility, psychology, sociology, um, as I told you, politics, economics, um, activism, rhetorics, dialectics, and even science and pseudoscience. So I try to have different characters because I want also people to be entertained. Um, there's like these two different profiles of people that I interview. On one side we have like hardcore, so to speak, academics, um, very important people from Spanish and Latin America here. And also I interview this other profile that they're the YouTubers. Maybe people who are liberty oriented but they are not aware of that. Um, I, you know, I pick them and I bring them to my channel and this is uh, this is a good move, I think, because the YouTubers have the followers, but the academics have this uh, strong, um, uh, strong idea, this, this uh, academy background. And if I combine it, I think people tend to like it. Like, I came to your channel because you interviewed this new YouTuber, but I also stayed because you interviewed this uh, uh, university professor. And, you know, when I received this feedback, it's like, Okay, <laughs> the job is done, that's what I had in mind. Then the final part of this talk is also a reflection, but I think it's important because I don't want you also to apply in case you're interested what I did. I mean, we have to know more or less what we're doing. That's, this is what I call the big picture. So what is the big picture? How to create an hegemony, in this case libertarian hegemony? So I think there's different actors in action, they need to be coordinated. And we can see that, surprisingly, I think this is happening in Argentina. One minute. Yeah, I'm close to finish. So in, we have these libertarian cultural creators. In this case, this is a photo of this uh, economics professor, Javier Milei, who appeared on TV and he's crushing it. And then this, we can see there's a cultural popular influence. 
we can see that in Argentina this is growing. I mean, thanks precisely to this guy, I could say. Then this cultural popular influence. Um, at the end, there are voters and consumers, so there's a, an impact on the on the political and on the market. And I think politicians and businessmen are aware of that. If they are aware of that, they will be able to apply more liberal oriented laws. And having these laws, we know it, it creates more free market and individual liberties. If there's more individual liberties and free market oriented policies, we can see there's more progress and middle class. And if there's more progress in middle class, we can see that we have achieved, so to speak, cultural and moral hegemony, and they will want to have more uh, libertarian cultural creators. But what is important is this first step, having libertarian cultural creators, and then if there's these different actors in action, um, we could uh, achieve certain hegemony. This is at least is how I see it. So what I try to do is to be in the step one. I think Gloria is also this kind of uh, character, at least this is how I see it. So this has been my, my talk. Um, you can download uh, the PDF in case you want. And thank you for your time.